Okay, this message this morning is when I think that God, his son, not sparing. In the opening line to the third verse of How Great Thou Art, hymn writer Stuart Hine writes the following, and when I think that God, his son, not sparing, send him to die, I scarce can take it in. Before we move on, let's just take a moment, just take a moment to consider the power of these words. Sometimes we, we hear things and they just zip on by. Let's just take a moment to breathe this in. When I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. Some of you likely be thinking, I know that already, Pastor Ray, I know that. And I would agree if you've been a Christian for any time now, uh, you do know that. You absolutely know that. You know John 3, 16 and 17, that God so loved the world that He gave His one and His only Son, that He sent Jesus into this world not to condemn it, but to save the world through the sacrifice of His life. I'm sure you, you know those things. You know that. But is your response anything like Stuart Hine? He knew, he knew these things also. But there's a profound difference in having knowledge of something and comprehending the spiritual fullness of what it means. This is all the more so when we factor in the cost that God paid to bring our freedom about. These things belong to the realm of I scarce can take it in. We're going to look into that some this morning. Perhaps I can convince you to take a fresh look at the cross uh, and view, maybe view it from a deeper perspective. Stuart Hine and his wife, Mercy, were serving as missionaries in the Ukraine when Hine first came across the Swedish hymn, O Great God, by Carl Boberg. We looked at this a few weeks ago. Boberg's poem was the influence for Hine's writing of How Great Thou Art. Hine and his wife first heard the Ukrainian uh, Christians singing this hymn as they walked along through the countryside. But Hine noticed that their focus was mainly on the beauty of God's creation and as God, on God's identity as creator. Not that there's anything wrong with finding God in nature nor seeing His power unveiled there, but Hein was right to conclude they needed to balance uh, between God's mighty creative nature and His sending His Son to die for our sin. The cross reveals a very different aspect of God than a beautiful sunset or His power as seen in creation. These things are only a glimpse of God's fuller revelation. This is especially true when we begin to consider salvation and God's greater revelation in Jesus Christ. Hein, being a missionary, was of course passionate about bringing the Ukrainians this deeper knowledge of Christ, and it was his passion uh, for the Ukrainians to know Jesus that provoked the translation and the writing of the third verse of How Great Thou Art as we have it today. Now, many people can grasp God's hand in nature. Many people can believe that there's a God when they look to nature. But that's only a beginner level of God's revelation and of our knowing Him. The revelation of God in creation can't bring us salvation. It can only point to the one who does. It, creation by itself can't reveal the fullness of Christ, but it should cause us to look deeper and search wider for God's truth and redemption. Romans speaks to this in chapter 1, stating, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. The greatness of God is revealed in creation so that humanity might consider who it is that they rebel against. So that all of humanity might consider its appalling lack of gratitude and unrepentant response to this majestic God who provides for our every single need, who loves us and cares for us. Instead, humanity's tendency has been to continue in its sin and rebellion. 
and even biting the hand that feeds it. Heine actually published a lesser-known verse that speaks to this very thing. Oh, when I see ungrateful man defiling this bounteous earth, God's gifts so good and great, in foolish pride, God's holy name reviling, and yet in grace, his wrath and judgment wait. A far cry from when I think that God is son not sparing. In this first line of verse 3, I, I find several profitable things for us to consider. The first is found in the opening phrase, and when I think. I think a better way to grasp Hines' intention here might be to understand this as when I contemplate, when I meditate upon, when I realize, when I reflect upon, when I ponder these great things. The word think fits better rhythmically as the song meter requires a shorter word, but I think, at least in this concept, concept is, it, is it an anemic word when we consider the implication of God's majestic greatness and the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf? Frankly, think doesn't begin to convey the response this great hymn is, is meant to provoke in us. Heine introduced this deeper concept already in the opening line to verse 1 when he penned, When I, in awesome wonder, consider. Consider. When I consider, in awesome or even awestruck wonder. I like that better because that's the idea here. It's not that, that it means, it's not that think means something different or consider means something different. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, the first entry for the verb consider is to think deeply upon or to think carefully about. And this is exactly what has made this hymn so powerful and useful to the ministry of the church. It, see, it calls us to go beyond surface thinking to a place where we deeply consider the depths of God's truth and the sacrifice of Jesus that makes it all available to us. Now, we live, I think everyone knows this, we live in a hurried life, right? Hurried lifestyle. Soundbite culture today, where precious little time is ever spent in any form of contemplation, and yet God, and who God is, and what He's done for us, through creation and, and then upon the cross to secure our eternity, our eternal destination, is worthy of our deepest, deepest consideration, isn't it? Maybe it's just semantics, but normally when I think about something, it's usually in the intellectual realm. I use logic and reason. I think in terms of pros and cons and benefits and drawbacks. I analyze the situation. I look at different angles. I look for solutions and changes that I might make, etc. But when I consider God, when I ponder who God is, when I contemplate His incredible majesty, when I meditate upon His great works and all that He has done for me personally, if I will take the time to do that, God invites me beyond reason, beyond logic, to the depth of His love and the treasure that's hidden deep within my soul and every one of our souls. Down through the centuries, the church has sung its faith, sung its heritage, from the Psalms of Israel to the hymns of the early church to the hymns of the last millennium to the contemporary songs of today. Our faith and worship has always been more than just thinking of God. Our faith has always been, and I pray it always will be, a passionate and loving response to the greatness and the kindness of our phenomenal God. And while emotional response without intellect leaves one without mooring and anchor, intellect without passion leads one to a thinking-only faith that never makes it beyond the mind to the heart. I'm sure you've heard this analogy before, but our faith, it needs to move that one foot from our heads to our hearts in order to be real in our lives. We need both intellect and passion to unlock the fullness of God, of what God wants for us. We need both in order to pour out the overflow to God and discover what then sings my soul truly means. This is why the church sings. This is why the church has always sung. Because something below the level of our intellect happens when we pray through music. That's what this is meant to be, praying through music. That's what corporate singing and worship has always been to the church. 
It's always been a means for our praise and our prayers of thanksgiving to rise up to God with emotion and passion, something that touches us as well as touching God. And for this reason, we must move beyond thinking of our corporate worship time as a few songs we traditionally sing when we get to church to a means of offering God the sacrifice of our hearts and our souls in worship. From the anonymous 7th century hymn, Be Thou My Vision, to Horatio Spafford's It Is Well With My Soul, to Newton's Amazing Grace, to contemporary worship songs of today, we see this deeper soul connection rising to the surface in the church's musical expression in worship. It's clearly the case here for Stuart Hine as he pens the phrase, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, Jesus bled and died to take away my sin. Paul had something to add in Romans 5 eight, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So when I think that God, His Son not sparing, sent Him to die, not for the righteous, but, those for, for, but for those bent on rebellion and sin, that includes me, that he bled and died to take away our sin and and replace our ugliness with his own righteousness. Frankly, it should take our breath away. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, but he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. And yet we, like sheep, we've all gone astray. Each of us is turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is Isaiah's way of saying, I scarce can take it in. Consider also the language of our scripture this morning from Romans 8, 31 through 39. I want you to notice the passion Paul has written into this section. Romans, as we know, is a highly theological letter requiring a great deal of intellectual thought and study in order to grasp uh, its theological depth. That's true. And yet our hearts and our souls must also be engaged if we're to recognize the passion and the emotion that Paul's words are intended to convey to us. Verse 31, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us as well, how will he not also, along with him, generously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is now at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us then from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long and we are considered sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is Paul encouraging us to grasp the depth of what it means that the Father did not spare his Son his one and his only son, but he gave him up for us all. And when I take time to deeply reflect upon this and I prayerfully consider the love it required of the Father, then I can grasp what Hein meant. Isn't that how it should be? 
Isn't that the only reasonable response to so great a sacrifice and so great a salvation? What then shall we say in response to these things, Paul asks? Perhaps I can scarcely take it in, is our best response, our only response. What is Paul telling us here in these verses? What is he encouraging us to believe? Well, first, he's disassembling any validation we might come up with for our fears that somehow God doesn't love us. That somehow he's, he's le- left us to alone, to go it alone. That he somehow abandoned us. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt abandoned by God? I think most of us had our moments when we felt like God abandoned us or he, he left us hanging out there. Doesn't mean that he did just that we may have felt that way. But Paul assures us that this was never the case. Again, writing in verse 32, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Don't be afraid, my little sheep, Jesus told us. For it's the Father's pleasure and joy to give you the kingdom. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? There's no need to be afraid. God is God over your needs. He is the God of our provision. We looked at this last week. He not only provides for our basic necessity, but he sends us peaches from time to time just to remind us of his love and his care over us. Though we may experience fear in this life, we all do, there's really no need to be afraid. This being the case, Paul goes on to ask, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? That means us, those whom God has chosen. Who will bring any charge against us? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? Utilizing a rhetorical style, Paul raises a question here that no doubt was on the mind and the hearts of first century believers, just as it is on the mind and the hearts of many today. If God has justified us in Christ, who then is the one who condemns? Perhaps it was different back then from how it is today, but from my experience, the voice of condemnation usually arises from within ourselves. Though I believe these thoughts have tentacles that that kind of reach back to the depths of hell, it is our own sense of guilt and pride that most often condemns us. And so Paul encourages us that these are false doubts, false claims, false fears. Again, his reasoning in verse 2, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? There's no need to be afraid. Just profoundly grateful. A profound thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, is what's in order. How can Paul promise these things? What is his basis? How do we know we won't be condemned? He answers those questions in the very next sentence when he writes, because Christ Jesus who died and was raised to life is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And what is he doing? He is interceding for us all. Paul began the chapter by emphasizing this point right up front in the very first verse when he wrote this, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. There is now no longer any condemnation for those of you in Christ Jesus. Listen closely for a moment to catch what Paul is saying. There's no reason to be afraid or to doubt your salvation or to think that God is somehow not for you but against you. There's no reason for that. Follow Paul's logic here. It's the good news of the gospel itself. Jesus will return someday, as the Apostle Creed notes, to judge the living and the dead. It's a scary thought for people outside of the faith, but it is not or shouldn't be a frightening thought for us. 
This is in agreement with Acts 10.42, 2 Timothy 4.1, Matthew 25.31-46, 2 Thessalonians 1.6-8, 2 Corinthians 5-10, and a lit literal host of other scriptures I could bring to bear. Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. Jesus is our judge. So when Paul writes in verse 33 that God justifies us, Jesus is in mind, as it is that very standard of justification that Jesus died to confer upon all of us. It's also the standard he will use to judge the living and the dead. Stay with me. This is profoundly deep and I think incredibly freeing. Jesus is the judge. He is also our sin offering and our Savior. Did you catch that? The judge is your Savior. By His life given on the cross, He's declared those who believe in Him free from judgment and condemnation. The judge has already freed us. And if that isn't enough, as verse 34 confirms, Christ who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. He's praying for us. Can you follow Paul's logic here to, a, to its glorious conclusion? Jesus is the judge. He's also our sin offering and Savior, and He is the one seated at the right hand of God who is actively interceding for us, along with the Holy Spirit who is doing the same thing. Paul tells us in verse 26 and 27 that the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through, the, through wordless, wordless groans, and He searches our hearts and knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. This is why Paul can conclude, if God be for us, who can possibly be against us? We have all that going for us. Who could possibly be against us? Only ourselves. We're the only ones that can be against us. We're the only ones who can mess this thing up. Perhaps we can conclude the same and accept this incredible gift of God of, of, in Christ at face value and then turn away from needless thoughts to the contrary that may arise out of our own guilt and shame. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the amazing grace of God that we who are sinners and at one time even enemies of God have been forgiven, reconciled to God, and then adopted as His children. We have been brought into the glorious inheritance promised to the covenant people of God, promised to any, anyone who will love and believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Or maybe I scarce can take it in. For God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Or as Paul concluded in Romans 5, God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us anyway. And in verse 10, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? And verse 32, once more, just to drive the point home, there's nothing to fear for those in Christ Jesus, for he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how, Paul asks, how will he not also, along with him, along with what he's done, graciously give us all things? In a few minutes, we're going to celebrate the Lord's table. We normally do that on the first Sunday of the month. But knowing this message was coming in the series, I, I felt like delaying it was the right thing to do in order uh, for us to, to better think and consider uh, what we've talked about and its weight and importance because the table becomes uh, the place where we, we remember what Jesus has done. And Jesus, knowing our weaknesses, He gave us. He gave us the table as a tangible sign of these truths. The table now represents the new and the everlasting covenant. The only thing that Jesus asked of us, other than our repentance and turning to Him for His grace, was that we might remember Him whenever we gathered. Jesus is the answer to our sin and all our life's problems. 
He is the eternal solution to our temporary earthly condition. And this table offers us a tangible way to receive him and to enter into his new and everlasting covenant. This table offers us a way to recall, to consider that the Father, his Son not sparing, sent him to die, to take away our sin, to wash away our sin, to cleanse us of our sin, so that we might escape the coming judgment and enjoy eternity living with God forever. That's awesome. That's awesome. Breathtaking. That we might recall and consider the cost to Jesus and the Father for the free gift of our sins washed away by His mercy and grace. This table is a, is a means to remind us that we have been transformed and fully reconciled by faith and that our souls are now forever connected to His. If you, if you don't have that surety, if you don't have that confidence in your heart, if you'd like to have it, if, you, if you'd like to have this surety of faith and connection with God, then this table is for you. And all you need to do is come to it because you're welcome to partake. If this is something new for you, you're welcome to come. You're welcome to come for it is your faith and your heart and honesty, honestly wanting to come to this table that confirms your eternal reservation. For those of you online, hopefully you've gathered elements at home so that you can join us uh, as we take communion together. It's not important what, you, what you've gathered, but that you're willingly, honestly prepared to reaffirm or uh, enter into the, this new and everlasting covenant. This table doesn't belong to Windsor Locks Congregational Church. It belongs only to God and those who will freely come to it by faith. All are welcome that come by the Spirit of God, have repented, and now stand ready to receive forgiveness through the atoning sacrifice of the, this table represents.